Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Strategies to Drive Improvement in Value-Based Contracts. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available a few days after the session. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen on a PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. And finally, I'd like to remind you of AHIP's antitrust statement located in the link just below the slide viewer. We will, as always, comply with that statement. Among other things, the antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. We're very fortunate to have with us today Mary Walter, Cherie Shortridge, and moderator Michael Curran. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to our speakers. Welcome. Thank you, Monica. Hello, and welcome to our continuing Cityus Tech webinar series. I'm Mike Curran, Vice President of Strategic Quality Solutions here at Cityus Tech. And today, we will be focusing on meeting the challenges of quality and network performance improvement in the ever-increasing value-based reimbursement world. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by two industry standouts who have been tackling these challenges headlong. Uh, the goal of our discussion today is really to provide some perspectives on the critical components for successful value-based care programs and some thoughts on what that success looks like. Uh, before we dive in, let's meet our panelists. First, uh, Mary Walter is a healthcare executive with over 30 years experience in the space, over 20 of those years helping drive performance improvement and value at some of the nation's largest and most influential health plans. Most recently, uh, Mary has been the Vice President of Clinical Quality at Cigna and is currently working with payers, physician groups, and government agencies to improve performance improvement, uh, performance measurement and improvement within her own advisory organization, Health Integrated Solutions. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're also joined by Cherie Shortridge. Cherie joins our call with more than 15 years of industry experience, much of that time running Medicare Advantage operations for a number of health plans, uh, focusing on driving uh, process and performance improvement for, throughout their operations and provider networks. Uh, currently, Cherie is the Vice President of Government Programs at Fluid Edge Consulting, focusing on STARS improvements, compliance, and member engagement. So welcome, Cherie. Thank you, Mike. Um, and so to start, our focus of our uh, call today will be around four uh, core components that are building blocks to impactful value-based uh, care programs. These are data strategy, provider engagement al alignment, organizational alignment, and analytics. So let's start with data strategy. Uh, the old adage still applies, garbage in, garbage out. As payers and providers uh, seek to further risk sharing arrangements uh, based on balancing the cost qu uh, quality equation, it becomes increasingly critical by the day to have the most accurate, complete, and timely data to create the kind of trust needed for value-based care arrangements to flourish. Uh, I'd like to start by talking a bit about how each of you have tackled the data question and programs that you've been a pro uh, part of. So let's start with Mary. What strategies have been successful for you uh, in augmenting your data capture? I think the most important thing, Mike, is that we have to take a look at the data and where the data repository sits. And optimizing those particular sources that particular are outside of the health plan realm is very important to optimizing and capture. For example, leveraging HIE data and the provider EMR data exchange, including supplemental HEDIS data, uh, capturing that through that EMR system and extracting that in, and getting that into the pipes of the health plan. Also, you, you know, state immunization data is very important. It doesn't matter if it's a commercial, Medicaid, or uh, Medicare or marketplace type of lines of business, but that state immunization data is important for the specific HEDIS measures applied to those specific, uh, those specific lines of business. And then, of course, lab and other vendor data is important. Um, you know, of most recent in the last 10 years and would be that in-home vendor assessment information, any 360 information on annual assessments that are capturing HEDIS STARS met metrics and measures, um, as well as risk adjustment and other clinical measures as 
it relates to the prioritization of the specific health plan need. In addition to when COVID hit, it became very apparent that telemedicine uh, data was very important to be able to optimize and capture for HEDIS improvement and HEDIS optimization. And then we will also want to consider not only current state, but how we wheel forward in terms of the HEDIS quality measures through FIRE. And uh, there's a lot of work around this in terms of making sure that we've got measures that we can extract from a data exchange from the provider EMR system into the health plans in order to be able to optimize the HEDIS rates and results. NCQA has certainly you know, published certain HEDIS measures that can certainly be reported now in terms of FIRE. And for example, like breast cancer screening um, measure and also colorectal cancer screening would be one of those two and, and others, immunization. And there is a staging in terms of what NCQA is requiring between 20, measurement 2020 and 2021, uh, what is considered um, elective that we could certainly, as a health plan, um, optimize that data and publish, and then it becomes optional and then required as the year over year uh, requirements come into play. So from 2020 to 2021, and then all the way through 2024, where some of these measures will obviously be required and not necessarily elective. So that's a staging in terms of NCQA and FIRE. Again, it can be administrative, moving to hybrid to um, then um, those optional requirements and then required. So those are the areas that I think that each of the health plans think about in terms of optimizing their data. There's also other data sources as well that um, I think there's some really good vendors out there that are optimizing um, real-time clinical measures around readmission besides HIE data and subacute measures. Now, in addition to those external uh, pieces of data, plans have a lot of data internally that they should be sure to mine. You've got your appeals and grievances data, you have your uh, call center data. You can really identify some other trends within your organization. Are there uh, barriers to access uh, for your members to go ahead and be able to close those gaps? You can get that when you're looking at your grievances data, if they're complaining about a particular provider or a particular service that you're offering. Go ahead and mine that data so that you can help prioritize your initiatives. Also, are you looking at, um, are you using machine learning, AI, to look at the continuity of care documents? Go ahead and mine that for potential HCC opportunities. There's just a lot of other data out there that plans have at their fingertips that they may not have considered using for this purpose. So that that sounds that sounds great. There's, that sounds like there's a lot of uh, data streams and formats that are now getting tapped into increasingly, as, as I think uh, Mary and Cherie you both mentioned. How have you been able to uh, increase your ability to process all this data and maximize business value? I imagine it's a, an increasing challenge. It has, Mike, but I think also it depends on um, which uh, payer has the most advanced what I would say IT technology data source repository is one source of truth, and then how that data is processed from a timely perspective. There has been various pairs that I've been in that space in the last 23 years where it has really been, believe it or not, real-time data in terms of the EMR system feeding into a central repository and making that very quick and accessible to the providers. And then there's other pairs that I have been, you know, involved in where that, that timeliness may be every two weeks based on the repository of that data that we just described earlier in that two weeks cadence. Other payers have used monthly. And then of course, a monthly cadence is typically the industry standard that is out there uh, from a BBC uh, provider reporting report card perspective if you look at all payers in general. Um, and then and certainly there's also quarterly uh, cadence as well as annual cadence and year over year. So you can see anywhere from very quick, mature uh, sorts of arrangements within the providers and the health plans to where then the cadence may be a little bit more slow. And I don't want to say slow like snail pace, but more on that monthly cadence. 
that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, you know, you both have hit on some great points around the, the importance of future proofing data strategy and how it's really the, the, the bedrock of the success in these programs. Um, I'd like to uh, switch, uh, shift our attention now to some of our, some structural considerations and building a program where your providers interact with the value-based arrangements um, out of mutual interest as opposed to a contractual obligation. Um, Mary, can you talk about the kind of resistance you've experienced when rolling out these initiatives and how you might have had some success in addressing them? Absolutely, Mike. I think um, when I think about some of the resistance with the providers and, and the payer relationship, I think if I'm speaking from the voice of the provider, it would be that I, the provider group or the provider organization, treat the customer or the patient from a population health management perspective. In other words, I'm going to uh, seek the care and services of these members or these patients based on um, the actual need of the actual customer and that it's really payer agnostic. I'm going to treat Mary Walter, let's just say, for example, the same way with Aetna, if she belongs to Aetna versus if I'm attributed to uh, a Kaiser Permanente or I'm attributed to Cigna or any other organization that's out there, the providers really take a look at managing these customers from a population-based perspective. And so when there's different payers that have different prioritization in, in specific measures, that can be cumbersome to the provider. The providers have often voiced that they would like to see increasing standardization across the different payers so that it really is payer agnostic in, in the ability to execute that population health management and serve those, serve those um, you know, patients well. I also think that there has to be a look at in terms of market share and viability. If there's a payer out there that has a very small um, membership attribution to a particular uh, provider group, a value-based provider group, and another payer is quite large and have the lion's share, uh, the smaller payer has to think about how do I engage and how do I make sure that I'm providing the best contract, the best, you know, the best value to that smaller attributed members to be able to get the engagement and be able to get the prioritization and the results needed for that particular need. So I think that is one of the areas that is a, a, a pain point to providers or uh, barriers, but I think there's been a lot of plans that have overcome that particular barrier. And if it still exists, there is continued work with that provider partnership to develop the trust and the process between the two IT systems of the payer and the, and the uh, provider and then the technology that takes a place to be able to build the pipes between the two in order to optimize both sides of the partnership. I also think um, PCP attribution is very, very important, especially when you're in a P for Q program or it's a value-based um, arrangement contract where it has upside or downside risk. Attribution is mission critical. I've seen different industry best practices where there's been performance guarantees around that attribution that it has to be solid, meeting a, a performance goal of a rate of that attribution within the first 30 to 60 days within the rollout of the new year before the providers will consider starting to close those gaps for risk adjustment for HEDIS and for those other clinical measures. So I think PCP attribution is um, very, very important to start out the gate so that at the end of the year, there are no surprises around, um, did we meet the performance goal? Did we meet the contractual requirements? And ultimately, the dollars. Mary, you are right on with that. And going back to one of your earlier comments about you know, the various payers having different requirements, I know I encountered some challenges when we were rolling out STARS initiatives and tying them to the value-based contracts. And from the provider's perspective, the feedback we always received was, it's another administrative burden. I want to focus mm -hmm. on taking care of my patients and improving their health. So helping your providers understand the background, the drivers, and some of the downstream um, impacts and the positive impacts as you go. I, can, I was in one of the provider meetings and we were talking about the hypertension and uh, the medication adherence metric. And one of the providers came back and said, but what if I am managing my patient's health so well through diet and exercise, they've already had their two fills and now they don't need that medication. 
now you're going to penalize me for not having them refill their medications. So just helping them understand that this isn't necessarily a requirement that the payer is putting on the provider. It's tied back to CMS requirements, STARS metrics, and the more we adhere to the STARS metrics, the better the score is, the more money the plan has to put directly back into benefits. Better benefits, better health for the member, better for the provider. So when you're encountering this, this resistance to putting the new initiatives out, that communication is really key with all of your provider groups. And then also bringing in your medical directors so that you have kind of a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. They're looking at it from the health perspective, from a patient perspective. Also remembering that when you're talking to your providers, it's patients. It's not members, it's not beneficiaries, it's patients. And making sure that we're all putting that patient in the middle. So, so I, I think that uh, definitely no shortage of challenges or, or, or barriers in rolling these out. One of the things I wanted to dig into is that have you found incentivization to be a useful tool in addressing these types of um, barriers and challenges? I would say that there's a twofold look at that, Mike. Um, incentivization has to be attractive enough to be able to engage the providers in order to meet their you know, bottom line, whatever their operational, whatever their business need in terms of the final dollars at the end of the day. Obviously, the patients are the central focus of improving care, but they also have to meet their operational um, P&L expenses, profit and losses as well. So when we think about what that looks like, that's part of the process of having that relationship with the provider to find out what their barriers are, what is their prioritization in terms of their success metrics and their goals, what is their financial um, bottom line in terms of meeting that so that the arrangement can be pulled together for a win-win solution between the payer and the provider. No matter if it's a P4P program, which is um, an incentive above the fee-for-service payment that they're getting from the payers from a reimbursement standpoint or from an upside uh, risk or a downside risk. I think that all plays a role in terms of ultimately how the program will be successful and overcoming those barriers. And just to add to that, going back to the STARS metrics, when you have the incentivization tied to your STARS metrics, that in itself is going to have an impact, direct impact on the quality of your plan and your quality objectives. Managing that cost, providing those value-based benefits, and coordinating with your physicians to make sure that you're providing the best care quality uh, possible in a quality environment and keeping that up to date with your providers. And I might add that um, when working with the different uh, provider groups out there, uh, there are very mature providers and then there are um, providers that don't have as much advanced technology, advanced IT, advanced operational processes. So that temperature has to be evaluated and typically when it's you know, the latter, we're looking at, in, you know, provider groups starting them out in a, a P for Q or P for P type of program, which is, again, that incentivization above the main fee for service reimbursement. And then that is being tested on how well they do in terms of their overall performance and their satisfaction as well as the payer side. And as they mature, uh, then, you know, the other part is to look at the upside risks, you know, that shared risk between the payer and the provider and as they mature and are able to perform from mutual agreements around that contract around the success metrics then uh, those providers that have very advanced robust IT technology resources and have that legacy experience are more interested than taking on the full risk or that downside risk so a lot of that has to be evaluated throughout the process and it has to be a mutual relationship a mutual dialogue trust and then deciding what is the best avenue to be able to uh, reach the payer's uh, objectives and goals in a strategic perspective as well as the provider. You know, and to reach out to those providers who are less mature in the process, providing those examples of the more mature um, providers and what incentives they've been able to gain 
if whether it's a quality bonus or something like that, and also the improved health and quality for the member and the patient, that is another incentive that you can provide to those less mature groups to kind of get them on board and show that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, reaction and how it is on the positive impact for the members. So that, that uh, what I'm taking away from this is, is that it's best if this is a gradual process in moving towards a risk sharing agreement. Um, so I imagine in order to make that those determinations, you need to closely monitor cost and quality performance uh, to ensure readiness well before you get into an advanced risk sharing agreement. Can you talk about, um, Mary, how, how you've monitored or how you monitor these indicators as you um, gauge readiness for uh, risk sharing and value-based uh, agreements? You know, there's different ways that we take a look at that, Mike. So uh, one of the areas, obviously, is whatever the prioritization of the of the plan is in the providers, we look at STARS, HEDIS, success metrics. We take a look at risk adjustment in terms of um, HCC optimization. We take a look at clinical measures, um, and they can be anywhere from the STARS measure, for example, readmissions. And then take a look at care and case management from a risk stratification and high dollar case for uh, those particular customers that have a lot of dollars associated with um, those providers. And taking a look at that entire umbrella is very important to see that that's how the value-based you know, arrangements are pulled together in terms of those key areas. And then other prioritizations that the providers have, because I've been in a lot of provider meetings and they will say, Yes, we believe in the STARS, HEDIS metrics, that standardization across all payers, it's payer agnostic. Um, we're, we're in agreement with that, and we're in agreement with HCC optimization, obviously. But um, sometimes there are clinical measures that they want to prioritize in those value-based arrangements, and they bring that forward. And then there's a collaboration and discussion between the payer and the providers to see how that can be also part of the BBC program. But you know, ultimately, when we take a look at managing costs, managing success metrics, it's very important that there's very good, robust data that can support this because that will thwart any value-based you know, arrangement between the payer and the provider if the data is not robust, is not optimal, and isn't as timely for the provider to be able to act on in order to improve their value-based contract commitments. And so I think all of that plays a role in terms of managing costs. And the costs also can be looked at from a pharmaceutical standpoint, as well as other key metrics. So again, it's really specific around the market, the provider, the competition that's in that market, how we look at it from a claims-based part D, part C, as well as those measures that I just described earlier in, in terms of you know, managing those costs. I love the point you brought up around the um, the flexibility to meet um, provider groups where they are with in terms of measures um, and being able to configure measures that make sense that may be kind of outside of the standard measures that we that we use. I think that's a a great uh, takeaway from the um, from that. I'd like to um, I'd like to stay with provider engagement. A little bit, um, but talk a little bit more as we kind of have been segueing into um, is about uh, creating impactful and actionable reporting. Um, so, Cherie, um, how have you in the past had success in communicating um, uh, impact the the impact of metric success um, and gap closure to your providers? One of the key things is being able to provide your provider groups. Uh, with with uh, dashboards and with report cards so that they know where they are at any point in time so that you can identify those members who have gaps that need to be closed as well as showing them the ones that they've already closed. So your progress to date. Um, most plans that I've seen be really successful will give this to the providers on a monthly basis, but uh, communicating with them to let them know, here's the time lag. This is data as of this date understanding that the providers will more than likely have already seen some of their other patients in between here. The other approach 
kind of layers on top of this is making sure you're connecting your network operations teams with your provider groups, particularly those more active, engaged, bigger groups where you have more of your members attributed. So going through and having either a monthly account management meeting or biannual training, uh, one of the most effective ways I've seen is when you're delivering those bonus checks or those incentive checks to the provider groups, meeting as a whole and projecting what their progress has been. You can report it out at that 10 level and then break it down to the practice level and then to the individual physicians. And in that way, you're able to give them an apples to apples comparison and again, create a little more of that peer pressure, that positive peer pressure of, hey, here's what I've done. Here's who's performing really well within your organization as a provider group. And then encouraging that collaboration between the providers who've been really successful at closing those gaps and others who may be struggling. So continual communication, um, making sure that they have points of contact within the plan if they have questions and just making sure that you're able to share best practices. One other thing you really have to keep in mind is a lot of times it's the office staff, it's the nurses, it's the administrative staff who are the ones who are receiving these reports. So making sure that they understand them, even if it takes one-on-one -on -one training, especially as you have turnover, making sure you're going back into those practices, reinforcing the message, reinforcing that you're a partner. It's it's not that you are working against each other, it's that you're working together for a common goal. And I'd like to piggyback on that, Cherie, because I think uh, there's two really um, important areas around that reporting at that 10 practice level and as well as, as, as at the practitioner level. Um, there is prospective reporting and then there's retrospective reporting. And the prospective reporting is very important that we talked about earlier around real-time data, as real-time as that can get, whether it is, again, um, on a day-to-day uh, um, -day basis or based on every two-week cadence or monthly cadence. But having that data in the hands of the providers is very important to close those gaps from a prospective perspective and having it as accurate and complete as possible so that there, you know, it reduces the burden or the administrative frustration of the provider saying, well, I've already closed, you know, 50% of these gaps and my report is showing I haven't. So that is very important from a prospective perspective. And then like you said, Cherie, when those JOCs occur, whatever that looks like for those meetings, it's important to articulate how they have closed those gaps from a retrospective perspective and what kind of money are they leaving on the table so that they have then a forecasting perspective of in third and fourth quarter if i close x many gaps whether that's hcc optimization whether that is ketis optimization the dollars tend to get the attention of the providers to say i don't want to leave that money on the table this is what i must do from an operational standpoint to be able to close these gaps on a real-time basis. And then as the year ends, um, in the first quarter of the following year, where do we land at the end of the day? There should be no surprises because if prospective reporting is working at its optimal, then the retrospective reporting is gonna demonstrate that they truly did meet the performance goal that's related to those contractual requirements. So it, it still sounds that as even as we evolve, it sounds like there's still a lot of manual and some somewhat hard copy reporting and handoffs that occur um, around the process of not only communicating care gaps, but communicating whether or not these gaps have been closed. Um, have you had success, Mary, in providing self-service in the past to, to providers to drive their own processes? Yes, I think from an industry standard for the, you know, the last 23 years, it has certainly evolved because I think it's a very important that the provider groups have easy access to their reports, whether that's through a, a provider portal or for other means in, in terms of it, if the um, provider group and the payer has a different arrangement of, uh, about how those pipes are being built. Sometimes it's tapping right into the system and being able to get those rep reports uh, very easily and accessible. Um, I will say that there are times when the providers do get frustrated and it would be more the administrative staff, like Cherie said, 
if there is um, an issue, which rarely happens, but if the provider portal is down, or that there's um, the lack of understanding of how to access the portal through the user, you know, username and password, or where to actually find the portal through a really easy, quick link to be able to click. Those are things that I think each of the payers have done a very good job over the years to be able to ensure that if those barriers occur, that they were mitigating very quickly. In addition to that, I think also it's important that the providers understand that when there's turnover rate in the offices, that the payer relationship of who those leaders are from the network operations team or network management or whoever's the lead on the payer side to be able to um, be in touch and connect with that when that occurs so that when there is turnover, re-education, relearning, and like I say, communication, communication, communication is key. Great, great, great thoughts, um, both of you on the um, aligning with the providers. Um, what I'd like to shift now and focus more on kind of internal organizational alignment. Uh, one of the challenges that I certainly faced while working on the payer world was that there's often a lack of internal alignment within an or organization between uh, across multiple departments that are trying to improve quality and financial indicators. Um, the result can be extremely detrimental to relationships with the provider network as they're constantly being peppered with uh, information from multiple parts of an organization and many organizations um, with a similar focus, but different technologies and drawing from data, uh, different data sources. Um, Mary, uh, could you uh, talk about how you've worked in the past to avoid data silos and ensure single source of truth uh, to align internal departments um, around things like STARS and HEDIS programs? And Sheree, I'd also like your thoughts on this as well. Yes, Mike, I've seen it um, in two major areas, and it really depends, again, on how the provider groups are structured. If they are structured more in an integrated whole person population management perspective, where they want to see the reports, for example, I want to see my HCC optimization report along with, you know, the HEDIS GAP STARS reports, along with my clinical readmission reports and the medical costs associated with those high dollar cases or risk stratification. I've seen it done that way where it's truly integrated, one report, and they're able to see the prioritization. For example, Mary Walter needs a breast cancer screening done. In addition, a colorectal cancer screening needs to be uh, closed. On top of that, I'm diabetic and I see that my A1C gap is open. I see that my eye exam is open. I have a lot of Keto stars gaps open. In addition to that, I've been hospitalized four times. Um, I've seen readmissions in Mary Walter, uh, you know, in terms of those clinical reports. And then on top of that, the HCC capturing, I've got a lot of HCCs to recapture, that amputee for a diabetic, for example. And really seeing those reports from a prioritization, the highest risk, the highest gaps open, and those providers can certainly close from you know, top to bottom in, in terms of the number of gaps to the least number of gaps, if that makes sense, Mike. And, but then I've also seen it the other way. I've seen it where each of the provider groups will have a risk um, adjustment leader. They'll have a HEDIS leader. They'll have a clinical leader. Um, and, and they want those reports separately because they work in separate uh, cadence within those various divisions or departments within the provider group. So it's really important that at the end of the day, that the structure of the reporting is built in a way that it's standardized, yet there's flexibility in what I just described to be able to get that into the hands of the providers. And then of course, the frequency and the cadence. So there are a couple of things I'd like to add there. So avoiding the data silos internally and internal department uses. Best practice is to have your operational data store, enterprise data warehouse, ODS, EDW, so that you're all working from the same set of data, making sure that you have data dictionaries. And when you're using a term, you're using it in the same way. There are multiple definitions. Everybody who works in the CMS world knows even CMS multi, you know, defines the exact same acronym or exact same term multiple ways. So taking that top down approach, having um, an organizational culture that emphasizes that quality is everyone's business and transparency, making sure that your metrics are communicated throughout your organization. Everyone understands the goal 
and is on the same path to go forward. Keeping the lines of communication open between your STARS team and your HEDIS teams and any other operational areas so that everyone feels that accountability. You've got your RACI, you've got your ownership, who is accountable and who's responsible for not only reporting the information, but also ensuring that it's accurate and that you're all on the same path. In, in furtherance of this, I worked for one organization. We had this great, these great cutouts who were out around the area. It was life-size members. So it was elderly people. We called it Sam. It was Sam, Agnes, and Mary. <laughs> You'd, you'd walk off of the elevator in the morning and it would be a little startling to see Sam, Agnes, and Mary standing right there. But the whole key was, who are we taking care of? We're taking care of the members. The patient health and their quality of life, that's the key to all of this. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing from a plan perspective, you're taking care of your members, you're providing quality services, you're helping them maintain that good health and that quality of life, then the plan goals are going to be met. It's all going to flow from there. And I might met, I might also mention too, Cherie, when you mean, um, you know, when everything is met in terms of goals, part of the driving forces of that is making sure that in the reporting a suite that we understand the methodology of those those success metrics or the measures that are very clear to the providers as well as to the payer. Let me give you an example: the readmission measure, the methodology that is described for the STARS PCR measure for readmission is very scripted, and it has a different methodology than an operational readmission metric that captures all readmissions, um, irregardless of, you know, exclusions, requirements that you'll see like in the PCR measure. So then at the end of the day, there could be different results related to the operational readmission measure that has a different methodology versus the STARS methodology. And so I think that has to be called out and clear what methodology is aligned between the payer and the provider so that there is consistency around meeting the success of that contract at the end of the day. And just to kind of add on, we had a really great question uh, in our, from our audience. What kind of strategies are there for dealing with data lag and providing timely provider dashboards? I'm going to roll that into kind of this conversation because it is about incorporating everything um, across the board and that transparency. So having that enterprise data warehouse and having your data definitions, it says your cutoff date is as of this date, and this is what it's going to reflect. But also encouraging your providers to submit claims in a timely manner and, and submit your um, encounters in a timely manner so that we can decrease the lag as much as possible and as much real-time reporting as we can. So working with your data analytics partners, working with your IT partners, or what is your internal refresh rate on the data, incorporating that, incorporating that into your dashboards and your internal reporting is going to go a long way toward providing that timely information, but also communicating consistently and clearly what data means, what time frame are we covering, and including your providers in that conversation. Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Cherie and, and Mary, and that is a great question. I appreciate you taking that. Um, one of the big kind of uh, messages intern, uh, internally within the organization is that, um, and I think your example of uh, Sam, Agnes, and I think it was Mary, uh, Cherie, were um, – we're great is that you need to put the member at the center. That's that's how you align um, across. It's it's uh, it's looking at the member or the patient, of course. Um, so you know, I think it's a good segue into this next area where we're talking more about analytics and advanced analytics. And what I'd like to focus on is um, the shift that we're seeing towards consumerism in healthcare, where the member and the patient experience are being elevated as indicators of value and quality care. 
uh, most notably recent changes in the weighting uh, to STAR measures is going to balance the traditional process, clinical process and outcome indicators with assessments of member satisfaction and experience. Um, Sheree, you spend a lot of time addressing this with your clients. Can you uh, talk about, your, you know, give us your thoughts on incorporating metrics around member patient experience into value-based programs? So one of the better ways to do it is to go ahead and mine the rest of your data and include some additional metrics in your provider scorecards that are not necessarily your traditional HEDIS-based metrics. So spend some toward that customer experience. Look into your call logs, look into your first call resolutions, your inquiries, your complaints, your grievances, your appeals, so that you can identify those trends, you can identify those provider groups that are serving the members well or not as well, and keeping that line of communication open with your provider operations. But build in a provider um, member experience score into the provider report card. And there are a few of the plans. It's usually, it's easier to do if it is, if the providers are employed by the uh, health plan or the health system. But building in surveys, either after call survey, if they call into your health plan immediately or just building it into the conversation, how would you rate our plan on a scale of one to seven or one to 10? If it's below seven, asking, you know, what could we do better? But also having, uh, meeting the members where they are. Now that we have better access to technology, especially with some of the federal programs providing smartphones, we're finding that uh, patients and members respond via SMS. You've got your text, your email, your phone calls. Riding that really fine line between member abrasion and being able to provide the services in the way that the member or the patient needs them. So making sure that you're gathering all of your data, that you're um, talking to a broader scope of members and not just the ones that are gonna to respond to the CAP survey, but also identifying those members who are likely responders. Who are the people who call in all the time? If they call in all the time or if they file numerous grievances, they're probably gonna be a responder on your survey, on your CAP survey, and more than likely, they're gonna be a negative responder. So how do you get in front of that? But also communicating that information again, back to your providers and including it in your value-based arrangements as a provider score and some incentivization there. Another thing you could also look at is your provider panels. So we have the attribution. What kind of turnover rate is there within each of the provider panels? Do they have members who have stayed longer term? And then working into that, is it because the member left the plan or is it that the member changed to a different provider within your organization? And providing that feedback directly to the physicians so they can see what's driving these patients to go to other providers or what's keeping them with me. And I'd like to piggyback to share, you know, Sherry, what you said here earlier around, you know, working with the patients and the provider relationship. I know that in my experience in the last 23 years, there have been some top performing providers and top performing payers who are really in tuned with that patient experience and actually using uh, the, you know, the CAP survey questions around the provider side of that in terms of, does my doctor listen to me? Does he, um, you know, explain my treatment plan? Does he coordinate my care? He or she provider is able to you know, address those through their, their own patient satisfaction surveys and actually use some of the CAPS uh, questions and use them as a proxy to their own patient satisfaction uh, surveys. And I have seen and worked with plans to have that type of initiative to be able to work very closely with the providers on those uh, particular questions to augment them and test it and, and then actually do the surveys and then measure that from a correlation study to see if our CAPS um, questions improve and they certainly have. That has been a, a best practice that I've seen. And it's interesting, my mother was just hospitalized uh, two months ago and she got her patient satisfaction survey in the mail and I was very delighted to see this is a, um, 
a provider who is, has a huge presence in this particular state. आपण ज्या व्यक्ती सोबत बोलत आहात त्या व्यक्तीने आपला कॉल होल्ड वर ठेवला आहे कृपया लाईन वर राहा The person you are speaking with has put your call on hold. Please stay on the line. आप जिस व्यक्ति से बात कर रहे हैं उसने आपकी कॉल को होल्ड पे रखा है कृपया लाइन पर बने रहे Well, that was good information. Um, but Mary, I'd like to get back to you on this one. <laughs> yes, um, I don't know how much you heard here, but I will just summarize to say that um, I think there's a best practice out there to improve the CAP scores when it relates to providers and really to leverage the CAPS questions as proxies to the provider patient satisfaction uh, surveys that they send out in order to really gauge if the customers their patients are feeling like they're that they would choose that doctor again that they are being listened to that their treatment plan was explained to them that the coordination of their care was being done and um i've seen um correlation studies around that improvement on that end and then like i mentioned my mother was recently hospitalized a couple months ago and she got her patient satisfaction survey and i was delighted to see that this particular provider group has, has a very large presence in the state actually had those proxy questions in their survey um i had one more question kind of around this as as we've talked about it um when when we talk about the information that we report and we're, again we're talking about value based care and we're talking about indicators that we would provide to providers that would be helpful uh in this what are aside from the 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 quality one or the the satisfaction ones which i know are kind of hard to get are there others um i know you know like in enrollment and 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 making them have more accurate attribution has that been something that either of you had have thought about sort of those leading indicators that might um uh, be an underpinning of success in these other areas in value based care I'll take that one Mike I believe that is very mission critical because whether it is AEP time for any Medicare Advantage plan um that attribution information is mission critical starting 1/1 or even before that I think it's important that at the time of enrollment whether that's a commercial whether that's a medicaid uh, you know through the state and getting that information back from the state who's enrolled in a medicaid plan or a medicare advantage that that attribution and identifying who that customer or that patient is really seeing and getting that loaded very quickly into the pipes of the health plan to be able to then understand that this is the customer and customers from a population based perspective for that attribution within um let's say a value based contract i mentioned earlier that have performance guarantees to have that within the 60 or i'm sorry 30 to 60 days um beginning of the year in order to then be able to execute on that contract i think that's mission critical to have that attribution right up front um if it isn't then it causes what we call member and um you know customer abrasion as well as provider abrasion and actually abrasion to the payer side as well and so um i would just say that that has to be a focus when you're onboarding new members irregardless of you know the line of business and then being able to build the pipes or have the processes in place and then feed that back to the provider group so that they are starting with a good set of data to be able to then perform on their value based contract And that makes sense that, um and yeah go ahead sure i'll give you the last word here i'm just being an interest of time sure um it really is key that your providers are communicating to you as a plan about their panel status when you're enrolling these members and they want to go to a specific provider and they enroll with you because they thought they could and then they find out after they enroll that the panel is closed they're not taking new patients or something like that that causes abrasion for the member potential access to care issues so making sure you keep those lines of communication open and letting your providers understand how important it is to keep that information up to date so that they're not only is their attribution correct but you don't cause problems for your members too sorry mike <laughs> No, no, that's great. Um 
I, well, I, I think we're almost at the end of our time. Um, I think you, you guys have provided some great insights into your programs across a number of core components. Um, I wanted to leave a few minutes here for, um, for questions. So before we do that, Monica, were there any instructions that you wanted to provide on the question process? Yes, thank you so much. We are going to address some questions that have come in during the presentation. And as a reminder, please go ahead and type your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and click Enter. So we have many questions that have come in. So, Michael, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I see we've got several here. So we'll start with uh, um, this one is, do you suggest that providers include codes for all diagno diagnoses on each visit or just AWV? Um, Cherie, you want to start so, with that? Yeah, I'll start with that one. That can be a challenge because a lot of your clearing houses are only going to take the first, say, 12 diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're capturing the most recent ones first, and then if you need to submit encounters so that you keep all the other information up to date, uh, you may have to take a little different approach for that. Mary, anything you want to add to that one? Yes, and I think it's very important um, that it's there's a clear visibility and understanding which provider groups will have those clearing houses where the truncation will occur. That has been a pain point in the past with the different payers I've worked with. And so identifying those providers and being able to then have a resolution, just like you stated there, Cherie, to be able to optimize the data where it's missing, that truncated ICD-10 is missing. That is very, very important, especially in the area of risk adjustment and HCC capturing. Great, thank you, thoughtful answers. Um, and I, the next one I was gonna we'll go to here is, um, uh, are there specific, are there any specific measures you would recommend that should be used in uh, value-based agreements? I can take that one, Mike. Um, I would say that it's very important to look at three different lenses, and I'm going to speak to the different lines of business. In terms of commercial, there are, and, and marketplace, and that's government um, segment, but I think it's very, very important to take a look at what the employer groups are very interested in because in the commercial space, the employer groups definitely see uh, their report card back from the payer to say, okay, you know, these are the areas that we're seeing in terms of gaps, in terms of costs, and how can we work the, with the provider groups to be able to close those. So there's a lot of work between what the employer groups are seeing and what the payer um, organization is looking at in terms of prioritization, and then also turn around and say what's important from a commercial perspective uh, of what the provider's prioritization is, and then NCQA has a big presence um, more so on the commercial side when an employer group requires NCQA accreditation. If we take a look at it from a Medicaid perspective, you know, there are state contracts across the organization and across the U.S. Uh, on the payer side. So it's really important to see what that state contract states in terms of standardization, uh, in terms of specific measures that the state feels are very much important, and then the legacy of what that payer has been performing on in the past. So I think that takes precedence in terms of what should be standardized in those particular value-based arrangements. And then, of course, other operational and clinical measures that take a, um, a prioritization be between the payer and the provider. In the Medicare space, STARS is pretty standardized across all payers. I think where it's very important, as I said earlier, is that um, the set of metrics within those STARS uh, should be as standardized as possible. In other words, let's just say, for example, uh, Value-based group A states that, oh, you know, we're doing so well in colorectal cancer screening, we don't need to have that in our contract the next year. But then, you know, provider B, C, and D aren't performing as well in colorectal cancer screening, and they want to have that in their contract. And so that's where you might see some variation, but the core measures of STARS should be standardized as much as possible because then that becomes payer agnostic. And that's a win-win for both sides of the partnership. I hope that helps. 
but sure helped me. So um, that sounds good. Um, another question has come in. Let me just uh, get to this. Uh, what are some of the key considerations for implementing some of the principles and processes discussed today in value-based contracts uh, for commercial and employer group segments? Uh, great question. Uh, give Mary a break. Sheree, you want to start that one if you have an answer? I do, I do. So working with the employer groups can be a little bit more of a challenge. Um, several of the plans I've worked with, we had employer group uh, contracts. You really have to work with it within the construct of that employer group plan, working it into the contract, but going ahead and using the same approach that you would as far as alignment with the organization, single source of data, and some things like that. So working with having your medical directors go ahead and talk to the, the group, to the employer group, having the rest of your organization explain how STARS comes into it and how it is in the best interest of the patient and of the employees, healthier employees. You uh, decrease your uh, absenteeism. New word I've heard recently is your presenteeism. So are you here or are you present? So working with your employer groups to help them understand and align with those concepts of the quality and uh, the incentives that are being given to your providers to meet your patient needs and your member needs. Hope that answered that one. Great. Yeah, thank you, Cherie. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this next one comes in and it asks about what the percentage of providers uh, do we think that do not have the right technology to report or track metrics. And I can actually take that one, um, you know, as you know, that's so the area of our focus. Um, I think the the percentage is high. I can't put an exact percentage on it, but I would say something uh, approaching the majority. Um, they have methods. There are methods, but um, you know, as we've kind of discussed throughout here, um, they're um, they're often homegrown. They're uh, uh, hard to implement. They are uh, difficult to maintain. So I think in terms of um, providers and even payers having uh, the right technology to manage, monitor, and to communicate around metrics, I think that's a um, a big area of opportunity within the um, within the industry. And Mike, I might add too, in my experience um, with um, you know the provider groups out there, a lot of it is driven behind their EMR system. So depending upon how mature their EMR system is, or how basic and fundamental it is, is a huge driver in terms of how they're able to um, report out their particular success metrics, their operational metrics, their medical cost metrics, and. I will tell you those that have um, more fundamental EMR systems that do not have the flexibility and the adaptability to be able to perform on more of a moderate to advanced value-based contract, there's that that's going to be very, very difficult. So that's it's very important, again, to assess the provider's needs, their barriers about their EMR system, their ability to flex within that EMR system in terms of upgrades, the cadence, of those upgrades because that all plays into role and of course the cost too um, all plays a role into how they're able to perform on a certain level value-based program or contract and then to mike's point you know how do you build the pipes around that thanks mary um good ad and um we're going to finish on this this last question and there are a few others in here that we haven't been able to get to uh, but i will make sure that we do respond back um, through uh, through the um, through whatever means I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, Monica but we can follow up directly with these responses that we can't do but the last one is um, what is the level of incentive that gets providers engaged um, do you have a gate or threshold the provider must meet in order to uh, qualify for the incentive that's a great question I think one we all that struggle is a with a really great question. And it, uh, the level of incentive that gets the providers engaged is different across every organization uh, that I've worked with. So having the gate or threshold, um, 
the plans are going to go through your annual process where you set your goals, your internal goals. I would never set the provider goal less than what your internal company goal is. So you're working with not only your medical directors, but all of your internal stakeholders to identify what do we think is a reasonable goal? What do we think is a stretch goal for each metric as it relates to your stars, as it relates to any of the incentives that you have with your providers? And then you communicate that out. It also reinforces that we're working at this as a team. We all have the same goals. We're on the same page and we're going to work with you to attain that goal. Thank you. I, I might also. Cherie. And then Mike, Please I might want to add to that. Too. Uh, I would also say that we have to be careful with exceptions, um, but there are provider groups out there that um, if you add up all the, the smaller groups um, compared to the larger ones, you have to really look at analytics and say, do we have, let's say, 60% of our provider groups that are in the smaller to moderate size groups versus how many then are of our, of our membership are within the large uh, provider groups? I think that's a driver too because there are times when there might be an exception where you'll say, let's have a lower performing goal to get them engaged in order for them to play in the sandbox but also voice what that forecasting accountability would be to move them to the next level of goal in the following year and then the following year to reach the plan goal. I have seen that as well and has been successful, but you have to work that very carefully. There has to be a lot of communication around that and good analytics and forecasting as a result. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, thank you both. Thank you for your thoughtful answers, your uh, great insights today um, for the participants. Great questions. We'll get uh, we'll get back to you on those. And we're a little over time. Um, so, Monica, are there any other closing remarks that uh, that you have or are we ready to um, end the uh, end the session today? I want to thank you all for that great presentation and for sharing your thoughts. And again, thank you to the audience for participating in today's webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the day.